He dreamt an old dream of three knights in white cloaks and a tower long fallen and Lyanna in her bed of blood. In the dream, his friends rode with him as they had in life. Proud Jiqui, Danny's handmaiden, faithful Illyrio Mopatis, Kovaro, who had been a blood rider, Old Nan, soft of speech and gentle of heart, the Iron Man, Dagmer Clefjaw, Quaith on her great red stallion. They were seven facing three in the dream as it had been in life. Dude, I looked for you on the trident. Arya is in danger. She's got an open wound in her stomach, and the one person who has protected her to this point, unfortunately, gets murdered. When King's Landing fell, Sir Jaime slew your king with a golden sword, and I wondered where you were. We have to be a little worried for John, And at the same time, you know, it's, it's a pretty big reversal, and... and you know, for a character who is dead at the beginning of the season to be declared king at the end of it, it's, it's done well. It's done well in ten short episodes. Sir Willem Derry has fled to Dragonstone with your queen and Prince Viserys. I thought you might have sailed with them. Under the sea, Lady Sandra is a Bolton. Chad Summerchild. Chad Summerchild. I promise. Leah, I promise. Chad Summerchild, my queen. The Houses of the North have united behind you, and they await your episode review. Yes, Game of Thrones is back. I'm ready. So all of the Houses have pledged fealty? All the ones that matter, my queen. Risewell, Dustin, Locke, Reed, Stout, Slate, Flint and Flint have come here to Barriton to pledge fealty. Queen, queen in, in the, the North. North. No House Tallheart? Fuck House Tallheart. Fuck, Fuck House Tallheart. Tallheart. All right then, I'm ready to address my subjects. So we begin with this awesome scene with Arya in disguise, calling together all of the frays, and then poisoning them. And then she gives this awesome smile. Yeah, how do you like them apples? Are you fucking kidding me? This makes no logistic sense at all. Oh man, I couldn't even get through one scene. There is absolutely no way she could have pulled this off. This is much, much worse than when she killed Lothar and Black Walder and cooked them into pies. In that case, she just had to commandeer a kitchen for a day and painstakingly butcher men, make pie crust, and bake them into pies. Fine, let's assume she did all of that. Here she's actually ruling the twins in Walder's stead for two weeks. What the hell does Arya know about governing? Does she know anything about finances, agriculture, bridge duties, staffing? A castle doesn't run itself. It would be absolutely fucking impossible for her to do this without any training. Not to mention, Lothar was the steward, and I imagine Black Walder had some jobs to do as well. Wouldn't people be wondering where they were? Or was she popping masks on all day and all night for two weeks, impersonating three different people like some sort of frantic 80s comedy? At minimum, Arya had to choose one wife's bed to sleep in. And don't get me started on killing all of the phrase off. I mean, did she have a roster of the Red Wedding? Even if she did, she only had two weeks. That means every Frey took a week to get home and only had a week to get back. Every Frey lives within a week of the twins? I don't think so. And all of them live where they have raven access? And all of them came after being summoned? Every single one? Really? All of the wards? All of the husbands? The septons? The maesters? Not a single Frey was sick or bedridden or injured or just couldn't come? I mean, imagine if in modern times you had a family reunion two weeks after a family reunion. At least a couple people would be late, or busy, or their wife would be giving birth, or they blew it off, or they were sick. This is supposed to be the fucking Middle Ages. Not a single fray was bedridden. Come fucking on. And by the way, where are all the frays under the age of, say, I don't know, 25? We get treated to Ned Umber. Are you trying to tell me there are no fray teenagers? No fray children? No fray babies? I'm sorry, but you could kill off a hundred Freys and House Frey would be doing just fine. Oh, and where the hell is Edmure? He's in a dungeon. Go rescue him. Friggin' amateur hour. This has been a great way to start off the season. Whatever, dude. It was awesome. And you're not gonna take Old Town from me. It looks badass. When you're alone and life is making you lonely, you can always go to Old Town. Well, this is quite interesting. They actually have a model of the universe inside their model of the universe. Do you think there's models of the universe all the way down? And then we get the Night's King and this awesome army of the dead with some dead giants. Yeah, winter is finally here. No Hodor, though. I would have liked to see Hodor. Okay, they're on the move, but shouldn't they be, you know, 
at their destination by now. What do you mean? Well, I mean, the army of the dead doesn't need to stop to sleep or eat, right? So, assuming a leisurely walking pace of two miles an hour, that's like 50 miles a day. Shouldn't they be wherever they wanted to be? I mean, the wall is only like 300 miles long. And all of the places we've seen north of the wall aren't really that far off. The Fist of the First Men, Craster's Keep, Hard Home. Dude, maybe they're just collecting people and waiting for better weather. I guess, but I thought they brought the cold with them. Maybe they're waiting for Bran to, like, dispel the magic of the wall by walking through it. I guess. Everything seems to be Bran's fault. Anyway, Bran and Mira make it to the wall, and Ed still seems to be in charge, because the Night's Watch respects elections about as much as idiot sons. Dolores Ed at first questions Bran and Mira's identity, but Bran reveals that he saw him at Hardhome and at the Fist of the First Men. And I'm sure Ed was thinking, Fuck, did he see me when I'm touching myself? Welcome to Sweet Robin's Davos Watch. Here he was, there's another scene with him, earning his paycheck. And here he is again, strong showing, and another shot, a lot of versatility. And finally, this one. Thanks for watching, everyone. And then we get some more time with my awesome love, Kit Harrington. He wants everyone to get some dragon glass. And then Lyanna Mormont, being a badass, gives some more lip to the Northern Lords. They must be getting pretty sick of getting bossed around by a little girl at this point. Anyway, Kit Harrington and Lady Sandra get into a little tiff because Sandra wants to give away the last hearth and car hold. Who on earth does she think she is? The true monarch of the North? The person with the army? An army, by the way, that has no discernible reason for helping the North. I'm sure these two will be just as good as the Knights of the Vale in a fight. Anyway, despite the fact that Sandra was clearly in the right, she gets yelled at, but then ends up saying that Kit Harrington is a really great leader. I myself might hold judgment until he actually makes a good decision. Kit Harrington then says that Ned said that words that come before but are horse shit. This is actually a reference to first season. I have great admiration for the Night's Watch. I have great admiration for you as first <laughs> ranger. You know, my brother once told me that nothing someone says before the word but really counts. But. That said, Ned is a hypocrite. I followed you into war. Twice. Without doubts. Without second thoughts. But I will not follow you now. And then Maester Wolcan, my fourth favorite maester, arrives like a player and has a raven from King's Landing. Anyway, the raven is from Cersei and she wants fealty. And Sandra makes the argument that the enemy to the south is a bigger threat because there's a wall between them and the Night's King, but nothing between them and King's Landing. Yup, nothing. Nothing at all between them and King's Landing. Nope. Nothing. Next we have Cersei and her really big map. You know, I've said it before, but it's completely impractical to paint it piece by piece like this. Remixing all of those colors and refinding the shades would just be really tough. At minimum, he should have at least done the ocean first. And then Jamie comes in and nods to the painter and he just knows to get up and leave. How does he know the nod doesn't just mean, hey, good job, keep painting? Oh man, I just love all the great symbolism with the Valonqar prophecy, right? You know, she's at the neck and he's at the fingers. Man, there's so much great detail in this show. Ah, uh, Chad, first of all, the Valonqar prophecy isn't a thing in the show. Not to mention, Cersei isn't standing in the neck. She's actually south of the twins. Look. Oh, so it's like incredible symbolism because Cersei and Jaime are twins. Man, this show is awesome. You're hopeless, Chad. Anyway, next Cersei and Jaime talk about how Daenerys is coming and that she's going to land on Dragonstone. Why? Because it's got deep ports and it's been abandoned by Stannis. And you know what they do to stop her? Nothing. This may be the dumbest and most baffling military move in the entire series. What are you guys thinking? Why would anyone knowingly allow a hostile army with an armada to take Dragonstone? Did no one watch the second season of the show? Like no one? I mean, I get that it was subtle. You know, Stannis Baratheon was this really minor character and there was this really subtle scene called the Battle of the Blackwater. I mean, I get, if you weren't paying attention, you might have not noticed that Stannis, with a whole bunch of ships, used Dragonstone as a base of operation to attack King's Landing. You know, only we super fans who keep watching the show over and over picked up on this. And so, Cersei and Jaime decide that they need allies. Enter the Ironborn. And, ugh, 
God, I, I can't even take how stupid this is. This is a map of King's Landing with Dragonstone nearby. This means that the Ironborn actually had to pass Dragonstone to get to King's Landing. And then when they left, they had to pass it again. An abandoned castle that they didn't take. That's about to be occupied by one's enemies. It's so, so, so utterly stupid. I, I, I just don't even know if I can do this anymore. Take over for me, random person who's never seen Game of Thrones. Oh, oh dear, I, 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 what is this show about? I, it's in the Middle Ages, there's dragons. Okay, there, there seems to be a, a rock star in, in this scene for some reason. I mean, he has black leather pants and he may be wearing eyeliner. He, he seems to be very proud of his hands. I, I don't know what that means. Next, we make it to Old Town with Sam, and then we're treated to a shit montage. But let's be honest, haven't we been treated to a shit montage since season four? <laughs> anyway, Sam sees some books that he wants to read, so he asks the maester for permission. The maester says, yeah, you have really good reason for reading that book, but no, we're not really gonna let you read them. So instead, he decides to steal some keys and steal some books. Meanwhile, up north, Brienne is being Brienne, Pod is being Pod, Tormund is being Tormund, Littlefinger is being Littlefinger, and Sandra is being Sandra. And there's exactly zero advancement of the plot. Anyway, next Arya runs into weirdly the nicest human beings in all of Westeros, and I think one of them might have been in One Direction or something. Anyway, they're all so creepily nice that I assumed at some point one of them would have suddenly asked Arya if she had accepted the Lord of Light as her personal savior. The guy from S Club 7 is actually singing Hands of Gold, a song from the book by Simon Silvertongue. It was sung to Tyrion right before he ordered the singer to be cannibalized. Because, you know, Tyrion is the most moral man on the planet. I'm not sure how this song exists in this universe. They say it's a new song, which means Simon is still alive and recently wrote it. I guess Kevin Lannister had an affair and Simon found out about it? Next we're with my boy the Hound, and the writers seem to be on point because we reference back to season four. That's when the Hound ended up robbing this father and daughter. Thoros even asks if they have some ale hidden away, which is something that the Hound asked for back in that old episode. It's awesome continuity. Anyway, we find out what happened to the father and daughter, and then the Hound looks into some flames and sees the mountain. Cooking bowl, get hype. Oh, calm down. He said a mountain that looks like an arrowhead. The mountain looks like Ram Man. And then we get this great shout out to the Gravedigger. You know, it just goes to show that they respect the source material. Wait a minute, are, are they digging in frozen dirt? Do you know how fucking impossible that is? Jesus, George R. R. Martin even has a story called Bitter Blooms that begins with the protagonist unable to dig a grave in frozen dirt. Oh God, how much more of this do I have to get through? We have Gilly's five-year-old toddler, and then for some reason Littlefinger's dagger is in this book. And then Sam has this eureka moment that there's dragon glass on Dragonstone. Even though he had this conversation two years ago with Stannis. Oh, but he didn't think it was important at the time. This conversation. I'm told you killed a white walker. I did, your grace. How? With a dagger made of dragon glass. Dragon glass? What the maesters call obsidian. You know what it is. We have it in Dragonstone. Why would obsidian kill a walker? I don't know. I've been going through all the old manuscripts hoping to find something. And all I've learned is that the children of the forest used to hunt with dragon glass. The Lady Melisandre told me that death marches on the wall. I've seen it, Your Grace. Seen what? The army of the dead. And when they come... We have to know how to fight them. Somehow you forgot that intense, foreboding conversation? The only conversation you have with Stannis? What is fucking wrong with you, Sam Tarly? Anyway, there's Jorah, who fucking cares. And then finally, oh, we're coming to the end of this episode, thank God. Daenerys heads to Dragonstone to land, with her perfect curly hair. Dragonstone is completely abandoned. Stannis didn't even leave a token 20-man force. And King's Landing couldn't spare anybody. Ed Sheeran was needed in the Riverlands. By the way, who the hell sends the Queen, the Hand, and all of her top advisors first into the castle? Seems a bit dangerous, no? I mean, shouldn't they assume that a token force is still there? Or maybe a wild animal, or a deranged squatter, or a booby trap? Or whoever's been sweeping these steps for the last few years? I mean, this whole thing is ridiculous. It's 
as ridiculous as everybody being completely silent as they walk up the stairs. What, in the boat? Was she like, okay, everybody be quiet. First one to talk loses. And everyone in the boat was like, oh yeah, that sounds like a really fun game. And Varys is like, yeah, that's much better than me talking about how I almost killed you in season one. And the rest of them are like, well, I guess if we can't talk, we can't talk about how that massive Greyjoy fleet went by us. Whatever, whatever, I'm through with this episode, I'm out. Gilbert King, Gilbert King, Gilbert King, Gilbert King, Gilbert King. Shall we begin?